Uh, all right, so have you ever filmed something? I know this is a video about photography, but if you get into film, you might experience this at some point. Have you ever filmed something and when you go back and look at it, you're like, wow, that is absolutely terrible. There is no way anybody's gonna watch this. There's no way this is any good. And yeah, so that's something that happened to me yesterday. I filmed the, this entire video, went back, looked at the footage and just realized, wow, this is something that I can't even use at all. But that's besides the point. I'm here again just to refilm. So this is me refilming a video that I shot yesterday. So yeah. All right, anyways, let's get into the actual video. What's going on everyone? It's Steven. Welcome to another video from Derek Capture. In this video, I'm gonna be giving you 15 terms that all beginner photographers should know. Now, this is gonna have a lot of information, so I hope you're ready. Buckle up. The first term I wanna talk about, aperture. Aperture is arguably one of the most important settings that you have on your camera. Hence why this is the first term that I wanna talk about. Simply put, aperture is the opening and closing that happens within your lens. A larger aperture lets in more light, a smaller aperture lets in less light. And if these dogs don't shut up, I'm gonna go crazy, cause I'm not trying to refilm this again. All right, we're good. When it comes to this, think about the pupils in your eyes. When you're outside on a bright sunny day, your pupils are gonna be much smaller because they don't need to let in any more light. When you're in a dark area, your pupils are gonna be much wider because they're trying to let in a lot more light. So how do you know what setting is your aperture? Aperture is always defined by an f-stop number. That means when you're looking at a camera, any number that has an f next to it is gonna be your aperture. And this is where things might start to get a little confusing when it comes to aperture because the closer that number is to zero, the larger that aperture is. So let's take two f-stop numbers. One is f2.8 and one is f11. When you compare these two numbers, f2.8 is gonna be a much larger aperture. That means that f2.8 is gonna have a much wider opening and thus letting in a lot more light. The f11 is gonna be a smaller aperture and that's gonna let in a lot less light. You can see why this is a little confusing, right? That's why you kind of need to think of your aperture and f-stop numbers as a fraction. We all understand fractions a little bit, so understanding your aperture numbers shouldn't be too difficult if you always think of it in this way. Again, I know this can be a little confusing at first, but the more you use your camera, the easier this will get for you. Something else that aperture affects is depth of field. Now that is a term that we will get into a little later, so I'm not gonna go into pretty much any details about that right now. Shutter speed is gonna be the next term that I wanna talk about, and like aperture, shutter speed is arguably gonna be one of the most important terms that you can understand about your camera. Shutter speed is the amount of time it takes for your shutter to close while you're taking a picture. Typically, you'll see your shutter speed in the form of a fraction, like one over 100 or one over 500, and that is the amount of time in seconds that it takes your shutter to actually close. So if you have a shutter speed of one over 100, that means your shutter speed is one one hundredth of a second. And if that sounds really fast, it's because it is. Experimenting with different shutter speeds is a lot of fun because once you start getting to the slower shutter speeds, like actually one second, two seconds, three seconds, that is when you start to get cool effects like motion blur. So when you're using shutter speed, if you want more of a freeze frame in your photos, then you wanna have a much faster shutter speed like one over 100. But if you want a motion blur in your photos, that's when you need to start using a much slower shutter speed. There are other reasons why you might wanna use a faster or a slower shutter speed, but those are gonna be reasons that we discuss in a future video. Now the third term that I wanna discuss is ISO. Now like the previous two terms, ISO is going to be arguably one of the more important settings that you can understand and know for your camera. It doesn't matter what level of photographer you are, ISO is gonna be just as important as shutter speed and aperture. However, ISO is pretty simple compared to shutter speed and aperture. With ISO, it is simply brightening or darkening your image. However, you need to be careful when you adjust your ISO on your camera. If you start to set your ISO a bit too high, your image is gonna look like it's a lower quality. A higher ISO will also give you a grainy look to your images or something that we like to call noise, which is another term that we will get into a little later on. So, if you have good lighting, you're more than likely gonna have a low ISO. And if you wanna know a little bit more about lighting and how it affects all your photos and videos, I'll leave a link to my previous video here. 
Something that I like to do is to always try to keep my ISO as low as possible. There's no point in making an image brighter if you really don't need to make it brighter. Unless you're going for a specific type of look in your images, which most of you, I'm assuming, probably won't. Now the fourth term I want to discuss encompasses the previous three terms, and that is the exposure triangle. The three points of the triangle are aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And as a photographer, no matter what level you're at, this triangle is going to be something that you always come back to whether you know it or not. Now I can go into much greater detail about this triangle, but I'm really not. All I can say is once you master this triangle, you're going to be able to master the lighting in every photo that you take. And I think it's important to note that these are the only settings on your camera that really affect how bright or dark your image is going to be. There are other factors that go into how bright or dark your image is going to look, but in your camera, these are the only settings that you use to really brighten or darken an image. Depth of field is the next term that I want to talk about because I said I would mention it a little later on, and it's a little later on now. So this is essentially how much of your image is actually in focus. We've all seen photos where just the subject is in focus and everything around it is blurry, and we've also seen photos where the subject is in focus and everything around the subject is in focus. These are different depths of field. Yeah, I always feel like I have a lisp when I say that. Depth, depth, depth of field. That's about as close as it's gonna get right now, so. One thing you can always do to change the depth of field of your images is to always change your camera's aperture. Using a larger aperture like an f2.8 will give your image a much shallower depth of field, meaning that more of your image is gonna be blurry. Using a smaller aperture will cause more of your image to be in focus. You can also zoom in or move closer to your subject if you want to change your depth of field without really changing your aperture. Moving on to exposure. Now I know I mentioned the exposure triangle earlier, but I didn't really mention what exposure was. If you want a simple explanation of exposure, it's referring to the brightness of your image. Now there are a couple other ways that you can use the term exposure. One common way is to use it in long exposure. Now long exposure refers to having a much longer shutter speed, which in turn is gonna give you those cool motion effects with your images. However, most of the time you hear the term exposure, it's gonna be referring to the brightness of your image. You'll hear the terms overexposed and underexposed a lot when you're a photographer. Underexposed means that the image is just a little too dark, and overexposed means that the image is just a little bit too bright. Moving on to the next term, which is noise, which is another term that I mentioned earlier and I said I would get to, and now we're getting to it. Now when I say the term noise, I'm not referring to sound by any means at all. Noise, when it comes to photography, it refers to the amount of grain that is in an image. Now I'm sure we've all seen images where we've seen a lot of grain in that image. All of that grain is noise. Noise is something that is much more prevalent in your images when you're shooting in a very low light environment. It's also going to start to become more prevalent when you use a higher ISO. Say you have an image that has a ton of noise and you don't want that much noise in it. A lot of the time you can save a little bit of that noise and get rid of some of it in the editing process. So for example, I use Adobe Lightroom a lot and in Adobe Lightroom there is a setting where you can raise or lower the grain of your image, but that all depends on your type of style as a photographer and what you want to present to your audience. So my big point about noise is that don't get too upset if there's noise present in your images. Sometimes noise is gonna be one of those things that is just unavoidable. Now the next term I wanna talk about is basically two terms combined and that is JPEG and RAW. Both of these terms refer to a file format that your camera takes pictures in. It can take a JPEG photo or it can take a RAW photo. JPEG is something that you've probably heard of before mostly because it's the most common way for photos to be saved. Now why is it the most common? Because most cameras have JPEG as a default setting for when you're taking a picture. Now when it comes to JPEG and RAW, JPEG is always going to be smaller because it is a compressed file. A JPEG file has a lot less information in it than a RAW file, so the file size itself is going to be a lot smaller. So one big difference between JPEG and RAW other than the size of the files themselves is the colors. JPEG has a very limited range of photos that it can actually display. To be precise, JPEG usually has about 256 different shades of red, green, and blue. Now I know that sounds like a lot, but when you compare that to RAW files and how they can have over 16,000 different shades of the same colors, then you're gonna see a huge difference. If you wanna have the ability to really make your photos pop that much more, then I would always choose RAW. I would just shoot RAW. Yes, it's a little bigger, but in the end, you're gonna have a lot more options about what you can edit, and that is just gonna lead to a better picture in the end, no matter what. White balance is the next term I feel every beginner photographer should know. When you fully understand white balance, you could potentially save yourself a ton of time before you even get to the editing process. 
So the definition of white balance in photography is the process of removing unrealistic color cast. Essentially this means that anything in your image that should be white, your camera is going to try its best to make white. Now there are a bunch of different types of white balance settings that you can choose from within your camera. And it's important to really try and pick one that best suits your photo. And if you really want to see if your white balance is working, you really need to try and look at how your image looks with your naked eye and through the camera. Moving on to the next term, and that is prime lens. In photography, there are going to be a ton of different types of lenses that you can choose from. And because you have so many lenses to choose from, you're probably going to hear the term prime lens a lot more often than you think you will. So what is a prime lens? It's a lens that is fixed at a specific focal length. You can't use this type of lens to zoom in or zoom out. So for example, a lens that I use a lot is the Canon RF 50 millimeters. Although it's a fixed focal length, it makes for some incredible pictures. Now the next term I want to talk about, especially after talking about prime lens, is zoom lens. If a prime lens is fixed, you can only imagine what the term zoom lens means. Zoom lens means that you can actually zoom in and out using the lens itself. These lenses are great because you have the luxury of changing the focal length. A lens that I use quite often and one that I use for a lot of my videos is the Canon 16 to 35 millimeter lens. With this lens, I have the luxury of zooming in and zooming out all I want. So here, let's see, let's see how it works. Zooming in, zooming all the way out. There we go. That is 16 millimeters, that is 35 millimeters. And let's try and get it back. All right, yeah, that is what a zoom lens can do. The change in focal length can allow you to be much more dynamic with what you're trying to shoot. Manual mode is the next term that I'm going to speak about. Now, when it comes to beginners, a lot of beginners are going to shy away from manual mode altogether. Manual mode is going to be extremely intimidating for any beginner because they're having to change all the settings themselves. Automatic mode, for the most part, is very easy to use because your camera does most of the work for you. But in manual mode, you have to do all of the work. There's manually having to change the settings of your camera, and there's manually having to set the focus of your lens. Personally, I feel manually having to set the focus is gonna be much easier than having to manually set all of the settings in your camera. Your camera can have a bunch of different types of settings that you can adjust, and sometimes you might not know what type of adjustments to make. And that is a big reason why a lot of beginners shy away from manual mode altogether. However, with manual focus, you can really see if an image is sharp or not based on the type of focus that you're trying to set. However, the more you use your camera, the more I would recommend trying to get into manual mode and manual focus because that's only going to make you a better photographer in the end. Moving on to the next term, and that is negative space. This term refers to the space in your photos that is unoccupied and surrounds your main subject. So for example, if you look at this frame right now, I am clearly the main subject and all of this stuff around me, all of this, script right here, so yeah, all of this is negative space. Using negative space effectively can really help your main subject stand out that much more in all of your images. And it's great if you want to use it for a minimalist photo that holds a lot of dramatic impact. But yeah, I don't have a good example of that right now, because if I did, I would definitely show you. But it's okay. The next term that beginner photographers should really understand is the rule of thirds. This is a basic photography term that could really help you with all of your photos. When you hear rule of thirds, I want you to think of a 3x3 three three grid. The good thing about most cameras nowadays is that they will actually display this 3x3 three three grid for you, so you don't have anything to worry about. But the rule of thirds pretty much says that you should place your main subject of any photo on the, one of the intersections of those lines. This is where people's eyes go naturally first anyway when they look at a photo, so having a main subject there is going to make for a more pleasing photo. However, the further along you go on your photography journey, the more you're going to want to venture off from that rule of thirds. One thing that can really hinder you from being more creative with your photography is being very strict with this rule. Photography is about being creative and following this rule very strictly is gonna really limit you from being as creative as you wanna be. So although this is a good rule to follow at first, don't be strict with it further along the line. Now the last photography term that I wanna talk about is bokeh. Now this is a term that I never know if I'm really saying right or not, but nobody's ever corrected me. So until somebody else corrects me, bokeh it is. Bokeh refers to the blur that is produced by the out of focus parts of your image. That's it. You usually have your subject that's in focus and everything else around it is typically a little blurry and the amount of blur that is caused by that is the bokeh. And what has the biggest effect on bokeh? Aperture. You're able to change aperture to the point where you can have a background that is extremely blurry or a background that is not blurry at all. And because that is bokeh itself, aperture is going to be the one factor that really has the most effect on how much bokeh you have in an image. Alright, there we have it. 15 
technically 16 photography terms that all beginners should know when they're starting their photography journey. I know this video had a ton of information in it, but these are all basic terms that you should really know if you want to become a serious photographer. So yeah, if you found this video to be interesting, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you want to, you can hit that subscribe button as well. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, at dare to gram. Uh, I got some pretty cool stuff on there, so I know you guys would actually enjoy that, especially if you're into photography. Oh, and I know I mentioned some pieces of equipment that I use for all of my videos, like uh, some of the lenses, the Canon EOS R, which is my camera, and I have a bunch of other equipment that I use too. So if you wanna check those out, I'll leave those in the description below. So yeah, other than that, I don't have anything else to tell you beautiful day so I'm about to go knock out a run. I'm Steven from Dare to Capture. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.